a beautiful way to remind us of that. In fact, second chances uh, fit our theme of this today. So thank you. Um, you know, uh, there was a preacher that I heard some time ago. I, I, I was the associate pastor. I, I did the children and youth, but they, there, there wasn't a raise involved in it, but they started calling me the associate pastor once I took on the children. Uh, the children's minister left, and uh, I, I was the youth in college at the time. We decided to kind of clump them all together. Anyway, and, and we, we called a new pastor, and I can remember the sermon from that ordination Sunday, that, uh, excuse me, uh, installation Sunday. It's from a gentleman named Buddy Sherman. Buddy Sherman was a well-known preacher in the South. I think he was from South Carolina, and he talked about a, a pastor needing to decide which side of the street he or she was going to walk on that day. Uh, there's often a, a dialectic or a conversation, sometimes a tension in Scripture. And a preacher has to decide which side of the street he or she is going to walk. And today, I haven't made a decision which side of the street I'm going to walk on. I think I'm going to walk in the middle, and then I'm going to go from one side to the next side. And then maybe back again. I, I really don't know. But, but um, I'm not picking a side today the street. Because I think there's some life in the tension of these scriptures. I think there's some life in the images uh, that Isaiah has. Isaiah has an image that Oliver read as abundance. A sense of come one, come all, no ticket necessary, you don't need your money. There is drink, there is food prepared for you. And then Jesus, in the passage that we read today from Luke 13, has somewhat of a different message, which is there's a time limit on this thing called mercy. See, the axe is laid at the base of the tree. I'll give it one more year, and we'll see what happens. One of abundance, mercy, unending, another one of an expiration date. So today we're going to walk in some of that tension and allow ourselves to feel some of that tension and just to sit with it from a faith perspective. So tension one, and I'll, I'll, I'll go to Luke here, chapter 13. It's a classic question really in any theistic religion, which is why do good things happen to bad people? It's a classic. <coughs> do bad things happen to bad people? Do good things happen to good people? At times, it seems to be that that's the understanding, that the good receive the good things in Scripture. And if you are bad, then you are naturally receiving the bad things. This, of course, is problematized in Jesus' teaching. Think of the man begging Lazarus outside of the rich man's home, and the rich man who received nothing in the kingdom that is to come, and the poor man who received everything. But some folks still in our day do ascribe divine purposes to human tragedies and to natural disaster. Blame is portioned out. We don't have to look for it long. Think of Hurricane Katrina and Pat Robertson coming out and explaining why exactly it happened. It was God's judgment, of course. Scientists would say, no, it's because we didn't really look at the levees for the past 50 years and that the water temperature has been warming over this course of what we call climate change. And so hurricanes are able to gather steam and force with these hot waters and dump incredibly powerful storms onto land. But still, folks like John Hagee and Pat Robertson wish to assess blame. Well, it's simply God's judgment on a world that has no good. Yet not only is this a misunderstanding of science, it's also a misunderstanding of God. Not to mention the hubris that's involved with speaking for God, lest we forget God's ways are not our ways. There are some who think God's ways are exactly my ways, and the hubris that's involved with that is dizzying. Jesus speaks to it directly and says, no. Don't apportion blame. Don't assess whether one is worse than another. Two examples are given from the Gospel of Luke today in chapter 13. The first is 
of a state-sponsored murder. Though there is no historical record of this event, what we can gather is that there was an apparent killing by Pontius Pilate. He was the governor of Judea, the governor of Rome, and he was known for his brutality. Galileans, perhaps, from the north could have been traveling for the annual sacrifices and could have well, very well been killed in that time. The other, which was brought up by Jesus, was of the Tower of Siloam that evidently fell, killing 18 people. And the question that Jesus addresses is, well, who is to blame? And you can, if you'd like, insert your bias here. Jesus' response, however, to such certainty is this. Are you any better than they? Are they any worse than you or anyone else in Galilee or Jerusalem that day? In other words, look to your own selves first. Let God's judgment be just that, God's, not ours. So to anyone who would stand as a Christian and begin to assign blame and mete out God's judgment, well, just simply stop. <laughs> In God's name, stop. The question is not one of blame, but one of repentance. A changing of course that leads our step closer to the divine. Repent and bear fruit while there is still time. So first let me say this, that religious blaming is never helpful. It's not helpful for others, but it's also not helpful for ourselves. Religious blaming, or what I grew up with and still have quite a bit of, guilt, isn't a great motivator for life. It's not a great motivator, especially if we're to understand this good news of God's love that pours over and creates in us new possibilities and new creation and new ways of seeing and orienting to the world. So let go of guilt. Enter into that love. A love not bound by your good or bad decisions. Not necessarily bound by karma, but bound by Yahweh and the steadfast love. Still, however, if we're to listen to the scripture, we understand that part of our call is to name our heart. There was a boy I, I knew who was in church one day. And he was in church running down the stairs. And he had with him his craft, and he was carrying it like so. And he had scissors in this hand and crafts and a little bit of a glue stick. And he saw his friend down in the distance. And he decided to run to catch up with him. So he's running down as he's carrying his craft carefully. And of course, toward the bottom step, he slipped, he tripped, and he whipped his hand back to catch himself as he was falling. And then as soon as he uh, 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 brought his hand back with, with such momentum, he crashed it right on the handrail, and he whacked it. His craft went up flying, the scissors went everywhere, luckily nothing happened there. But then he whacked his hand, and his hand was cut and bruised, and he sat on his bottom step. Now the teacher was up watching him and seeing him at these stairs. The teacher came down and sat right next to him. I think this was actually his son. Anyway, so it's true, sir. The teacher came over and, and sat right beside him and said, are you okay? He said, it looks like that would hurt. And he looked up and quietly, kind of collecting himself, collecting his thoughts, maybe collecting himself, not wanting to cry right then and there. He stood up and he looked back at the step and he kicked it. He said, stupid step. <laughs> and the teacher said, it's okay to admit your fault. It's okay. Should, should you be running with scissors? No. Should you be running down steps? No. It's okay to name your part, she said. It's part of what heals us. It's part of how we're known. It's part of how we grow as people, to name our part. And it's okay to do it. You don't have to blame. You don't have to redirect. Just own what's yours. And I think this is some of Jesus' invitation. Not to blame or to assign judgment, but to simply name our part within grace, within love, within a fight, within a community, with yourself. It's okay to name your part. It's a difficult request, to be honest. 
The ego is a funny thing. The ego that is that self within us that is the public self, the perfect self that we wish to portray. Well, it's designed to do anything but to assess or to accept blame. It directs or redirects. It distracts. It attacks. Anything to avoid admission. Beyond the individual, uh, individual ego, it's also a difficult task for businesses, cities, governments, or large organizations to name their part. It's almost unheard of for anyone to take responsibility. Whether it's the contaminated water in Flint, Michigan, or Merck Industries piling opioids into the impoverished Appalachian regions of West Virginia, for the nuclear lobbyists now who simply want to point the finger at Larry Householder, oh, it was only him. Naming our part is central not only to ourselves as people, but also to as a society if we're to function and trust, making us more able to listen and to trust one another, and also on an individual level to listen and to trust God. What then is so troubling to me in passage, it, 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 what follows in passage, uh, in Luke's passage in chapter 13, is there seems to be a time limit on this honesty before God. As, as though there's an expiration date on these things, an invitation to humility, but you better get right quick. And how does God draw these lines? And likewise, how do we draw these lines? This is part of that tension. This is a bumbling call to grace and the security of love, but by God, get to a quick kind of thing. And so let us walk on both sides of the street, asking ourselves, so when is enough enough? This Friday, David Tomasachi and I, and I asked him to, if I could share this story, we were touching base on today's service. We had a helpful phone call reviewing material and trying to select that one song that represented the tone of the sermon, which David was asking me to pin down. We hung up the phone around 9 a.m. and I received a text around 10.45 a.m. and I'll read the text with David's permission here. He said, well, I found a compromised song that should work for the message in music, but there was absolutely a perfect song called God of Second Chances, but it's written by David Haas, so we can't really use it. Now, you may be guessing my reply. Why can't we? Why not? And by the way, that was this other perfect song. Not to say it wasn't. <clears throat> Which I then quickly followed up after Googling the name David Haas and said, Oops, just Googled it. To which David replied, well, over the past year, it's come out that he had been sexually abusing many of his female students. And then we just paused. How many chances does a God of second chances give? Who do we sing from and sing about in this church and in the church? And what lines and boundaries do we draw? Though God's judgment is God's, are we ever not to make an assessment and a judgment ourselves? And if so, how do we do things well? There seems to be a message of Christianity that invites us to act and love uh, uh, without a single boundary. Can the message of love be the same both for victim and victimizer? God's table is set, like Isaiah says, no ticket or purchase is necessary, come one, come all. Lamb, go ahead and lay down with the lion. It's okay. But where are the boundaries? For the songs that we play in worship, for the names that we will call God and won't call God, is he still appropriate for God? A God of spirit and a God who's known as a hen who, ga a hen who gathers her chicks under his wings, under her wings, excuse me. What about relationships? The relationships we'll keep and the relationships we'll let go of for the habits we maintain and the habits we let go of. How do we judge among those? 
Looking specifically at the parable of the fig tree, the owner has had enough of this fruitless tree. It's been three years, the owner said, and it's borne no fruit, and I'm tired of it. Chop it down. It's not producing a thing. A thing. Of course, the gardener wants to put conditioners in the soil to tend to the tree, to give it more nutrients, more attention, and the owner is fine with that response. The response of offering another year. But how many years does this go on? We're left wondering. Will it make it after this next year? Will it be chopped down? Will it ever produce fruit? How long can God hang on? I must admit I pull back from these parables of judgment. I'm careful as a student of scripture and history not to use this as a blanket indictment of Judaism, which many folks have. For this and other reasons, I've never been keen on these parables of judgment. I assume that God's grace will over overwhelm even the most strident of evil, but perhaps as Christians we need these parables. Not just for ourselves to straighten up and fly right kind of thing, but as a way also to acknowledge that there may be a time when enough is enough. When there's no fruit to produce. When does it become all up? When does it become a question of loving ourselves when we say, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. I'm sorry. There are such things as Toxic relationships, toxic environments, toxic boyfriends, toxic girlfriends, toxic loyalties that cause more harm than good. I'm not sure that grace is our only and necessary response to every individual happening in our lives. As Christians, sometimes we also have a hearty no, or a hearty, well, we'll give it another year, but I'm not going to hold on forever. An article in the BBC recently discussed the power of the, of the not-to-do list. The article argued that we should start thinking less about everything we need to do, and that list that we create, whether at the beginning of the day or the end of the previous day, however you do your list, instead of thinking about that, we should think about what we shouldn't be doing. Canadian businessman Andrew Wilkinson has employed this strategy by his admission in his own life with great effect. I think it's quite interesting. He calls them anti-goals. Wilkinson started this after noticing that his day was filled with activities and things he couldn't stand doing. He was feeling stretched, worn out, and uninspired, doing business with people he didn't trust, with a schedule that was dictated by others. So what did he do? Wilkinson worked with the mindset that he didn't want to maximize the positives, but instead he wanted to minimize the negatives. So, he created the worst possible work day ever. He generated a list of long meetings at the office, a packed schedule dealing with business folks that he didn't trust, and then he looked at that list and he decided that he was going to do the opposite. <laughs> he was going to limit his time limit his business dealings to only people he did trust. Meetings were going to be kept to an hour, or at least very close to an hour. Those were his anti goals What can we let go of? What can we shed? How can we say no as Christians? Now, not all of us have this kind of latitude in our jobs, but most of us answer to someone or to multiple someones, and we don't have a choice, at least, so it seems. But to say that we have no choice at all over what we do or don't do, or what is and isn't producing fruit, whether in our lives or in our relationships or in ourselves, is to surrender agency. God is judge. We have no right in assessing blame or pointing in human tragedy and assigning it to one people or another. But we do have a place to judge, discern what is fruit-bearing and what isn't, and dare to make some of those decisions as well. It's interesting inside of the street to walk, is it not? Where accountability and lines lay, particularly in a grace-filled people and in a grace-filled church. And I don't have those answers per se, 
but I know that we do need to start asking them. What are those anti goals? What do you need to let go of? What do you need to say no to? What isn't bearing fruit, yet you're still filling it, producing or toiling, conditioning the soil? How many years do you have? Buddy Sherman told me to work one side of the street, and maybe he was right. But maybe two sides of the street allow us to see the breadth of Scripture.